Welcome to the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Glad that all of you are here tonight. We want to welcome all of you that are watching by television or listening on the radio or even on the internet. We're glad that you're tuning in this evening as we take a look at this subject of the seven seals. Now, in our last presentation, we talked about the Lamb and the opening, how he had the power to take the scroll from his Father's hand and to open the seals. And so tonight, we're looking at these seals that he's opening. That's what we're looking at tonight. And so our subject tonight is the four horsemen of the apocalypse because the first four of those seals are horsemen. We're going to talk about those four horsemen. But actually, the seals that you read there, you need to understand as you read your Bible that it covers the sixth and seventh chapter of Revelation and the first verse of the eighth chapter. That's what's involved in the seals. Tonight, we're just looking at the sixth chapter and that one verse in the eighth chapter. Tomorrow night, we'll take a look at the seventh chapter, but that all has to do with the seals. So that's what we're looking at. And tomorrow night, our subject is entitled the 144,000. Because that's what the seventh chapter is about. The 144,000 and the sealing of God's people. That's what it deals with. And so that's what we're looking at uh, tonight and tomorrow night. And we hope that it'll help you begin to see what is happening and what's taking place uh, as God reveals in his word and to John, what is to take place on this earth with mankind. And so tonight, we'll go and take a look at the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the other three seals that are mentioned there. And uh, it'll help you get a view of what God is saying and what really transpire, transpires and takes place in the rest of the book of Revelation. So we're glad each of you are here. God bless you as we study God's Word tonight. We're happy this evening to have with us Pam and Jimmy Rhodes. They're guests of ours and friends of ours, and we dearly love them and appreciate you being here, Jim. And uh, they're going to bring the music to us this evening, and uh, Jim will be playing a company, and Don will be accompanying Pam. And she's going to sing a song entitled, My Forever Friend. And you'll be blessed by that in a very special way. But before she does, uh, Chuck Algar is going to come and he's going to read the scripture to you that deals with what we're talking about tonight, the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation. So follow in your Bible as he reads it. Good evening. We had an exciting night last night, and we're going to have another one tonight. So if you have your Bible, we're going to go straight to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 6. We're going to read Revelation chapter 6, and then we're going to read the first verse of Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. So if you have your Bibles, let's read together. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given him. And he went out conquering in to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given him a great sword. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard the voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. And when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And so I looked, and behold, a pale horse. The name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. 
and power was given to, him, to them over the fourth of the earth to kill with a sword, with hunger, with death, and by beast on the earth. And when he opened the fourth, fifth seal, I saw under the altar souls of those who had been slain but for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given them, each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little longer until both the number of the fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. And I looked, and he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its slate figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, the commanders of the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Chapter 8, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. May God add his blessing to his word tonight. Everybody needs the Savior's love and grace. No one stands alone. Makes no difference if you're just a child like me or a king upon a throne. For there are no exceptions. We all stand in the night. Everybody needs a friend. Let me tell you my forever friend my leave me never friend from darkest night to rainbows end, he's my forever friend even when I turn away cares for me his love no one can shake even as i walk away he's by my side with every breath i take and sometimes i forget him my halo fades to shine My 
my friend died for you. So if you'd like to meet him and don't know what to do, ask my friend into your heart and he'll be your friend too. He's my forever friend. My leave me never friend. From darkest night to rainbows in, he's my forever friend. He's my forever. Father in heaven, tonight as we open your word, we pray that you would help us to open our hearts. May the Holy Spirit be present. May it fill our lives. Reveal unto us your word. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding that we might see and know what you have revealed in your book, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This has had a lot of discussion. The seals have over the years, but I think the Scripture lays it out quite clearly, and we're going to start out by reading the text here that says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying, With a voice like thunder, come and see. Now, Christ, or the Lamb, has, is opening the seals. This is what he's doing. Uh, these seals, how should I explain? They have some very important things that you and I need to know about them. One you'll find the first four are four horsemen. And those four horsemen tell about conditions on the earth. But the last three are not horsemen. And there is a decided change uh, after the fourth horseman. Then you have three seals that deal with uh, God's judgment upon the wicked. And that's what we'll be looking at tonight. But the reason I mention that is there are four horsemen and then three, uh, three seals, and there's a separation and different. You'll find that same scenario carried on with the seven trumpets, and you'll find the same scenario carried on with the seven last plagues. So as we get into those, watch for that because you're going to find the Lord divides them, the first four, and then the last three does that, and you'll see that taking place as we uh, study those different ones. So we hope that as we continue on here, but John's there, and one of the living creatures, which is the very first one, the lion, has spoke with a voice like what? Thunder. And he's told John, come and see. Now, evidently, with Christ opening these seals, the living creature has invited John to come and take a look in there, and John sees what is revealed in that seal. That's what happens here. So let's see what he sees in this seal. It says, And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So here he sees this man on a white horse, has on his head a crown and a bow, 
and he's going out to conquer and to conquer. Now, let me start out by saying that white is used in the Scripture over and over and over and over again. Not only does it talk about white, a white horse, but it talks about all kinds of things being white. It talks about having white robes. It talks about white garment. It talks about a white throne. It talks about white hair. It talks about a white stone. It talks about a white cloud. All those, white represents purity, represents righteousness. Put it down, friends. There is no place, no place anywhere in God's Word without exception Never is there a place where God uses white to apply to the Antichrist. Did you follow me? And those people that take this white horse and try to apply it to the Antichrist are totally out of place because he never applies white to an Antichrist. Just does not do that. It represents purity, represents righteousness. And so this rider is coming forth on a white horse to conquer and to conquer. And he's going forth. This represents the gospel. The gospel is pure. It's righteousness, and God has given it to be preached to the world. And Paul gives a little indication of what's happening here because he talks about this. Listen, and I looked, and behold, a white horse, he who sat on it had a bow and a crown, was given to him, and he went out conquering the conquer. And by the way, the crown that's on his head is a laurel wreath, which represents victory. This is what is happening there. This is what Paul said. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, now listen to it carefully, which was preached to what? Every creature under the heavens of which I, Paul, became a minister. Paul is saying that in his day, the gospel had been preached to everyone at that time. Folks, the gospel went out with such tremendous uh, victory and was accepted that by the end of the first century, there were five million Christians. Now, you stop and think that in 70 years, it has gone from 12 to five million. That's how many people have accepted. So when it talks about him going out to conquer and to conquer, indeed it has done that. It's gone forth with great power, and many, many people have accepted it and believed. That's why this horse is white. That's why he goes out to conquer and to conquer. All right, let's go on. By the end of the first century, Christian, Christian population was five million this covers the date from about 31 to 100 A.D., and let me caution you about this. The Bible gives periods of time here. We put these dates in because they seem to cover that period of time, but don't tie those dates down in stone because they overlap one another, and that's talking about a section of time, not trying to put a date on each end of it. Are you with me? So give room there for there to be some overlapping because there will be. All right, the second one. And when he opened the second seal, I heard the sound, second living creature say, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to him who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and the people should kill one another, and there should be given to him a great sword. This horse is red. And he's gone out, and he's going to do what? He's going to take peace from the earth and uh, kill people, has a great sword. Let me just say a word about the sword. Uh, back in those days, there were two types of swords. There was one sword that they used that was a short sword, and that was used for hand-to-hand -hand fighting close up. But they also had a long sword that was about four foot long that was used by those that rode on horses. And when it speaks of a uh, uh, sword here, that's the kind of sword that it's talking about. And he went out here, take peace from the earth, should kill many, and he had a great sword. <sighs> Folks, any time in history that the gospel 
has moved with great rapidity across the earth, and there has been a revival, and people have reached out and accepted the Lord, and there's been a tremendous influx in Christianity. There has always been persecution. I mean, the devil, every time it's ever happened, the devil has been there to persecute the church. And here, as the church grew with such rapidity in the first century, all of a sudden, Rome turned her hatred upon the church because it looked like Christianity was going to take over because it had moved with such rapidity. And so they turned their wrath upon the church and they began to persecute the people. If you were a Christian, you could be hauled in before the magistrate if you did not offer as a sign of worship your allegiance to the Roman Empire, then you were taken, taken to the arena. And there in the arena were those people who had stood firm for their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and what in Christianity and lions that hadn't eaten in days were turned loose upon those people and they became food for lions. It talks about it as a terrible time. This was the period of time from about 100 to 313 A.D. There was a period of time in there under Diocletian. It talks about 10 years in which he fiercely persecuted the church. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, and you may be tested, and you will have tribulation, what? Ten days. From about 310, or excuse me, 300 to about 310, this time that Diocletian, persecuted the church with such great, great uh, hatred, and literally thousands gave their life for what they believed. And by the way, if you notice that text in Revelation 2nd chapter, the time as we studied the seven churches, the time of Smyrna parallels this same period of time. That's what it's talking about. Okay, this was a time of persecution. Then we come to this next horse, it says, and when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the, in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a Daenerys, and three quarts of barley for a Daenerys. Do not harm the oil and the wine. Now, you'll find almost invariably, not only when Christianity advances and, and many, many people reach out and accept the Lord and it grows, that the devil has persecuted it, but if he cannot accomplish his means by persecution, he uses something that, as far as I know, has never failed. And that is by compromise, flattery, enticement, he has been able to lead people away. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said to each one of you, be careful, watch out for the cares of this life. If he can just get you, you, you remember when uh, the children of Israel were on their way to the promised land, and you remember... Uh, the king there, Moab, were, was afraid of him, and he went and hired this prophet by the name of Baal, uh, ba Balaam, excuse me, of Balaam, and asked him to come and to curse the children of Israel. And you remember he went up there on the mountain and got everything ready and tried to curse them, but instead of cursing them, he wound up blessing them. Three times tried, three times wound up blessing them. And finally, the king was so distraught with him, he said, get out of here. You're not doing helping me at all. You're making it worse. But Balaam wasn't dumb, folks. Balaam knew what he couldn't accomplish by blessing them or by cursing them. Uh, he could accomplish another way. 
And listen to what happened. Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of who? Balaam. Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the in incident of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Uh, he got these Moabite women to go down and to lead these people astray. Sexual immorality, the worship of their God, anything he could do to get them to turn from their God, he was able to accomplish. And so, that's the reason you have this third horse uh, that's black. See? Black representing just the opposite of white. It's where white was purity. Black is just the opposite of that. And so he's riding on this black horse. And this is what he's accomplishing through it. Uh, Woodhouse, in his book on the apocalypse, had this to say. As the stream of Christianity flowed farther from its foundation, it became more and more corrupt. Let me just stop right there. That's a danger, folks, that we face so much that the forefathers were believers, staunch in their belief, and they believed it, and they held to it, and they gave their life for it, and they preached it with everything they had. But as it gets farther and farther from its foundation, we lose the sense of urgency. It became more and more corrupt. And as the centuries advanced, superstition advanced with them. Tales of purgatory, pious frauds, and the worship of saints, relics, and images took the place of pure, simple Christianity till at length the book of God laid aside for legendary tales and traditions of men. All these corruptions were collected into a singular system of superstition and oppression. This is what happened to the church. It moved, lost all the thing that it had. And so he said, a quart of wheat for Daenerys and three quarts of barley for Daenerys do not harm the oil and the wine. Well, let me start out by talking about a Daenerys. A Daenerys was a day's wage. That was a coin. That's a Daenerys. And it was a day's wage. And so, a day's wage, you could buy a quart of wheat. But drought, folks, drought definitely affects strongly grain. And so what they couldn't buy, and if they couldn't, they could buy something that was not as nourishing and not as good, and that was barley. They could buy three quarts of barley for it. What does that mean spiritually? It means these people were being served spiritually not very good food. In fact, just the opposite of what they needed. It wasn't giving them the nourishment. And that's why he's talking about receiving a quart of wheat or three quarts of barley for Daenerys. Hurt not the oil or the wine. The oil represented the Holy Spirit. The wine represented the covenant between God and His people. You see, a drought affects uh, grain very, very strongly, but it doesn't hurt as much oil and wine. They're much stronger. And so he said, don't hurt it. Make the Holy Spirit available to the people. Those that want it, it should be there for them. And this is what the oil and the wine stood for. Do not harm the oil and the wine. It was available to the people. So to you and me today, the Holy Spirit is available that relationship, the covenant between you and the Savior is available to each one of us. This represented the period of time from 313 to 538 A.D. That was the period of time that it covered. Let's go to the fourth horse. And he opened the fourth seal. I saw, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, 
Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to him over the fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beast of the field. So this fourth rider is death. Hades, or the grave, is following him. And he's there, and he's killing a fourth of the earth. Now, when I was a boy, uh, in the fall, when we harvested potatoes, went out and dug up the potatoes and cleaned them. My father would have us clean them all off as best we could. And then he would have me go and crawl under the house. And he ha would have me lay those potatoes out on the ground under the house so that they didn't touch one another, but all th over the ground there. And that way they would stay all winter long and uh, but they would sometimes put out sprouts and, and all and if you went in there and got one of those potatoes that had sprouted it was pale green because it didn't have any light see and that's the same thing here when it says this horse was pale because it represented no light you see darkness was the one before. They had taken away the truth of God's Word. The people couldn't get it. They couldn't lay hold of it. Now, darkness had brought about death. Death's riding on this horse, followed by the grave and all. This was what was taking place. And it says that power was given him over a fourth of the earth. Let me explain what happened here. By the time... We came to 500 A.D., okay? Christianity had exploded across the Roman Empire. I mean, millions of people had accepted it. It had exploded so much that the Scripture, the Scripture had been interpreted, I shouldn't say interpreted, translated into over 500 different languages, by 500 A.D., it had been translated into over 500 different languages. By 100 years later, there was only one translation, and that was in Latin. And if you couldn't read Latin, you were out of luck to read the Word of God. The Scripture was taken, chained to library walls, and the people were told they were too ignorant to read it. And all of a sudden, that which had been lacked uh, the Word of God and had been brought to them and they didn't understand it or was weak in that, now all of a sudden it was death. There was no Word. They didn't have it. And dear friends, you know how long that went on? For one day thousand years. One thousand years. The people basically were without the Word of God. So, death came to reign. And powers given him over a fourth of the earth to kill with a sword and with hunger and with death and by the beast of the earth. Not only did the people die, how should I put it, did they die spiritually? It was taken away from them. But this text also applies physically. You go back and read that period of time. And it's during that period of time when plagues came across the nation, particularly in Europe. Have you ever read about the Black Death? It came on Europe. In a matter of three years, it killed 20 million people. This was in, in 1508. Killed 50, 20 million people. Died. A fourth, if you please, of the population died. Just as the Scripture said it would take place, it happened. 
This was a time in which the people didn't have the Word of God, a time in which there was ignorance, a time that we refer to in history as the Dark Ages, when things went backwards. This was the fourth seal, the fourth horse. A period of time from 538 to 1517. That was the period of time that it covered. Well, let's go to the fifth. Now, please notice, all of a sudden, we no longer have horsemen. We no longer have one of the living creatures that we talked about last night. We no longer have those saying, come see. Uh, it's been a decided change here in what is happening. And when I opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. I should take the time right here. When it talks about the uh, altar, the altar here that's talked about is the altar of sacrifice that was out in the court. That's what it is talking about. And when they brought a sacrifice and offered it, and it was slain, they took the blood and they poured it at the base of the altar here. Very important. They poured the blood at the base of that altar. And so it says, these had been slain for what? The word of God and for the testimony which they had. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They said, How long, how long is this going to be until you're going to avenge our blood? And then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, was completed. So I said, and God told him, listen, you got to rest a little while longer. White robes were given to them and said, rest a little while longer. Why is it telling them that they are to rest? Well, you remember, this is the same application you find in the book of Genesis when it says, and he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. It's not saying that there were souls literally under the altar. It's saying like Abel's blood was a witness. It's crying out against them. They said the blood of these. These were the people, folks, that were killed during the time of the Reformation where they were slain by the thousands by the Inquisition. Massacre of St. Bartholomew, where 60,000 were killed in one day. This, this is what it's talking about, and they're crying out, Lord, how long is this going to go on until you judge, avenge our blood that we've died for? How long is this going to take place? Well, there's a reason why he said to them, you've got to rest a little while longer. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave will what? Hear his voice and come forth. The time of the resurrection had not come. It was not time for the dead to be resurrected. And so he said, you've got to rest a little while longer. This, this has to take place. How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So he said, you know, here's white robes, rest until Jesus comes back. How long is it going to be until they're judged? Daniel answered that question because he said here, how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Said, said how long is it going to be? And the angel answered here, and he said unto me, For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. We're not going to go into that prophecy tonight. But he, t he told him a definite period of time how long it would be. And that's the reason 
It says here in Revelation 22, 12, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his works. In other words, God's saying that the judgment had to take place first. The judgment had to happen before you could have the resurrection. And so he said, how long till this, until you're going to judge and avenge our blood? And he said, well, it's going to be for 2,300 days. Then it's going to be cleansed. And so they were asleep and will remain so until the resurrection. This is how long they were to be there. This represented the period of time from 5, 15, 17 to 1844. This was the time that you and I uh, refer to as the time of the Reformation. This is the time in which the gospel was preached to the world and thousands upon people, thousands of people reached out and accepted the gospel and gave their hearts to the Lord and followed him. Marvelous time of history because the earth or the world was coming out of the dark ages and they were first time. Many of them had gotten a view or a glimpse of the gospel and what it really meant. And so it was a time in which they were able to see this. But folks, what he's saying here and this is why it's the fifth seal. You see, he's changed. We had those four horsemen that said what was going to happen on the earth. But all of a sudden, when you get to that fifth seal, now he's going to tell you what's going to be the results and the judgment of the wicked. That's what he's dealing with here. He's telling, telling the wicked, okay, here we're giving you this period of time to repent. But now, if you don't, this is what's going to happen. And I hope that as we go through this tonight, you're beginning to see a timeline of where we are and what's happening. Okay. 1560, men like John Calvin, Martin Luther, Zwingli, all these great reformers stood up and preached. And out of that, like with John Calvin, folks, 500,000 Frenchmen gave their hearts to the Lord. 500,000 through his preaching. And many of those people paid with their lives. They died. That's why it says here, I saw under the altar souls of those who had been slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. You see, again, the gospel spread, and the devil turned his wrath upon those that accepted the gospel and followed Jesus Christ. And then a white robe was given to each of them. I'm going to give them a white robe. Again, white is a sign of what? Purity. Righteousness. How wonderful this is. That the Lord Jesus Christ says here, to each of them was given a white robe. Christ says that to you. To each of you, he will give you a white robe. So it doesn't make any difference, folks. It doesn't make any difference how bad you may have been. It doesn't make any difference how dark your sins may have been. When the Lord Jesus Christ gives you that white robe of his righteousness, then, dear friend, you're clean. You're pure in the eyes of God, no matter who you are. And to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. See, it represents righteousness. That fine linen given to that person and says, this is the righteousness of Christ that he's given to you and to me. These are the ones who came out of what? Great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They came out of great tribulation. Remember that word great tribulation because it's important. And they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. After these things I looked and behold a great what? Multitude 
No one could number of all nations, tribes, people, and tongue, and this is out of tomorrow night's presentation, great multitude, look what they have, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hand. That's all of God's people, clothed in white robes because it represents purity and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Listen, immediately after the what? Huh? Tribulation. tribulation of those days. Immediately after the tribulation. In other words, this was the time of persecution during the time of the Reformation, and it fell off, fell off in the late 1700s, and it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. This is what Christ said. This is his words here in Matthew 24. Watch. The Son of Man will what? Will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. In other words, we're down here now, folks, to the sixth seal. And with that is the coming of Jesus Christ. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as the sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Now, he said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, which were coming to an end in the late 1700s, he said, all of a sudden, the sun's going to go dark. The moon's going to turn to blood. The stars are going to fall from heaven. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it was rolled up, and every mountain and island removed out of its place. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the commanders and the mighty men and every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? This represents the period of time from 1844 to the coming of Jesus Christ. That represents the period of time in which what? You're living in. Yeah, so you need to know where you are in the stream of time. And I looked, and when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as the sackcloth of hair. The moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Said when it came to the end of the tribulation those days, these things would happen. And just exactly as it said, 1755, you have the Lisbon earthquake, one of the greatest earthquakes that's ever happened. At Lisbon, a sound of thunder was heard underground, and immediately afterwards, a violent shock threw down the greater part of that city. In the course of about six minutes, 60,000 persons perished. The sea first retired and laid the, dry, the bar dry. It then rolled in, rising 50 feet or more above the ordinary level. 1755, the earthquake. Watch. The dark day of May 19, 1780. What happened? And by the way, there's no explanation for this. Almost, if not altogether alone, as the most mysterious and yet unexplained phenomena of its kind. I've read people's attempt to explain it. Stands as the dark day of May 19, 1788, the most unaccountable darkening of the whole visible heavens and atmosphere in New England. Though at 9 o'clock that night the moon rose to the full, it had not the least effect to dispel the death-like shadows. After midnight, the darkness disappeared, and the moon was first visible, had the appearance of blood. So just exactly as God said, we hit that sixth seal, and it said, These, this is what's going to happen. And it happened. said that the stars would fall from heaven. 
November the 13th, 1833. No language indeed can come up to the splendor of that magnificent display. No one who did not witness it can form an adequate conception of its glory. It seemed as if the whole starry heavens had congregated at one point near the zenith and were simultaneously shooting forth with the velocity of lightning to every part of the horizon, and yet they were not exhausted. Thousands swiftly followed in the track of thousands as if created for the occasion. And so the stars fell as thick as snow. And I've read accounts of this where it said that people literally went out and laid on the ground and cried because they thought that judgment had come. They said this was to be signs that was to happen, that marked, that marked the period of time that we had moved into. Dear friend, those same signs, it says, will happen at the coming of Jesus. So we, we are living what the Scripture refers to as the time of the end. That's what we're living during that time. This sick seal is being poured out. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it was rolled up. Every mountain and island was moved out of its place. In other words, after these signs, the next momentous event is the coming of Jesus Christ. It says the heaven's going to split right down the middle. Roll back like a scroll. Islands and mountains are going to move out of their place. And the kings of the earth and great men and rich men and my commanders and mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains, the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come who is able to stand? Jesus Christ comes back at the end of the sixth seal. That's what happens. That's the time in which you and I are living. This is the time in which you and I can expect the coming of the Lord. Yeah, you see, people might say, oh, they've been saying that for a thousand years. Oh, I, I agree, they have. But they haven't had the signs that you and I have had. We have seen things that nobody else has seen. We have seen things that, without question, undeniable, fulfill the Word of God. We're living when Jesus is going to come back. And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour said, open the seventh seal, and there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. Why? And when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, how many? All the holy angels with him. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. In other words, all the angels and the Father and Christ have left heaven. They've come to gather his children home. They're the ones there, and he's calling them to be ready to prepare. So there's silence in heaven for about a half hour. And when the Son of Man comes in his glory, all the holy angels with him, that's the time in which you and I are living today, a time in which Jesus Christ is coming back. And so those seven seals have fulfilled one right after another. Tomorrow night, we're going to take a look at the sealing of God's people because we've talked about what's going to happen here and what's going to happen to the wicked. How does God's people fare during this time and how does the sealing take place as we take a look at the 144,000? Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we have seen your hand and your leading in the history of mankind and we can understand that we're right down at the close when Jesus is coming back. We pray that tonight our hearts might be surrendered, that we'll lay everything in this old world aside 
and we'll cling to Jesus Christ, that we will walk with him, follow him, reach out in faith and take hold of his hand, and follow him into the kingdom. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. May God bless you. Have a good night. Every day, thousands risk their lives to protect and serve their fellow men. They have a deep commitment to excellency and teamwork. And when others run from danger, they run to it. Even if it means personal sacrifice. Even if it means making the supreme sacrifice for another. They're always on call, ready to serve, no matter what. Friends, you and I can learn a lot from firefighters. In the United States, the majority of them are volunteers. That's right, volunteers. But even for those who are paid, it's more than a job, it's a calling. Jesus said in John 15, verses 12 and 13, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Those who follow the words of Jesus are his friends. But Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrated his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What an amazing thought. Christ laid down his life for us, even though we were not his friends. A firefighter is willing to do the same. He's constantly preparing for his next mission because his own life and the life of others depends on his training and qualifications. My friends, that's what we're doing right now with this series. We are preparing you for what is to come. Our goal is to make you skilled in the Word so that by the power of God you can bring others to safety, the safety that can be found only in the arms of a loving Savior. Won't you help us to train and prepare others to fulfill this mission? Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, Post Office Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll-free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television. Your gifts bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. The Revelation of Jesus Christ is available on DVD. Each individual program from the second series, Revelations from God's Throne Room, may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire seven-part series, including Worthy is the Lamb, Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, The 144,000, The Seven Trumpets, The Time of the End, The Two Witnesses, and War in Heaven may be ordered as a set for $59.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 1-888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or you may order online at kennethcoxministries.org. The Revelation of Jesus Christ on DVD. Each individual message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors.